Good morning, everyone. Um, well, it's an honor to be here, um, and, and I apologize that Mary Ellen uh, Trapella Fawn can't be here today, so I send her uh, regards. Um, thank you for the welcome, and also thank you to the local First Nations, um, the tsleil tooth the Squamish, the Tawasin, and Musqueam uh, First Nations people for allowing uh, me and many of us to live, play, and work on this beautiful territory. I'm confident that you're all aware of Mary Ellen's impressive CV, um, her advocacy for vulnerable children and youth at the bench, as a lawyer, as a fierce advocate, as a family member, and as a mother. She's known locally, nationally, and internationally um, for trying to improve the outcomes for kids. She's often called the watchdog, and I've always taken a bit of offense to that um, when I've sat in the room. Um, who wants to be called a dog, first of all? Um, but more importantly, I, in my humble opinion, think she's a warrior that watches out for our children and their families. Um, so um, I, again, I apologize for her regrets. I'd like to take a moment to share a little bit about who I am. Um, my bio informs some of the work that I've done, but it doesn't really shed light on a bit of that lens. Uh, I grew up in the projects. I grew up with um, an exposure to family violence. Um, very young, you know, became one of those statistics that you hear about native, poor, impoverished, um, addictions. I'm not sure why my mom um, let me watch the burning bed when I was seven. Um, but it made sense later on in life about uh, the tears that she had uh, from that movie. And it was a pretty, for those of you, raise your hand if you've seen Farrah Fawcett and The Burning Bed, pretty graphic film uh, to share with a child. Um, but that was a reality of, of my life and my childhood. And um, it also kind of spoke to why I didn't have much of a relationship with my father um, and why those relationships were um, severed. So that was the first part of my life. The adult years, I wanted to get into what are we going to do about it? Um, like the other warrior ladies in the house and the other warrior men in the house, um, wanted to make a difference for social justice. So I've worked with the RCMP. I was a summer student, wore the uniform um, up in Hazleton, BC. If any of you have had the opportunity to be up in Hazleton, um, there are, I, I believe there's like six or seven villages. Um, but policing is hard in that community. Um, I didn't know how fast of suburban can go, 160. Um, <laughs> um, and attending to the types of calls in Hazleton were astounding. The sexual assaults, overdoses, um, the domestic violence, remarks that were made sometimes in the community about why don't they just kill each other? Um, and, and always feeling a little bit voiceless in, in that arena to what do you say when you're a woman who's in your early 20s about isn't that racism? Um, isn't that sexism? <clears throat> so anyhow, um, I've been a native court worker. I've um, been, been within the court arena and have been an advocate for several years now with the representative for children and youth. So I just wanted to share that um, just to bring light on what, where my lens comes from when I think of family violence and the impacts on children. I'll launch in. Um, many of you are probably very familiar with our mandate. Uh, for those of you who aren't, um, speaking to the presentation that was made earlier, we're an independent office of the legislature and we do have um, enforcement power through section 10 of our act. Uh, we do advocacy, we monitor and we investigate. So the advocacy is on behalf of individual children and families across the province. The monitoring is done through research and audits. Um, we released a plan of care audit last year. This year we looked at adoptions. We also investigate critical injuries and death reviews of children. Um, many people are familiar with our reports, but I just wanted to shed light on those three functions. Some key areas that intersect with our uh, mandate, sorry, some key, some key areas that intersect with children and families that are outside of mandate include education, immigration, and citizenship, and FLA. So since the time that I've been with the office, approximately 25% of the calls involve FLA, and we have no mandate um, to help families. So that's a huge systemic gap in the areas of advocacy. <clears throat> so that's our formal um, 
our formal role. One, domestic violence, mental health, and parental addictions are really huge to Mary Ellen. If you hear her speak, those are the three, uh, the, her, it's her mantra to build a system that protects children from uh, violence. So the themes that I'd like to talk to you about today um, when we speak to domestic violence is to look at child protection through the lens of, sorry, to apply a child protection and a human rights lens through, do you have some water? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you. I want to share a glass with Abby. Pardon me. Um, we need to apply a child protection lens to the area of domestic violence. So last year, uh, many of us are aware there were amendments made to the Child Family Community Services Act, um, which makes a child in need of protection if they're emotionally harmed by the parent's conduct or living in a situation where there is domestic violence um, by or towards a parent with whom the child resides. Uh, we know that there is ample debate around the amendments to this act, um, but there's substantial evidence that shows that children who witness domestic domestic violence has an impact on their brain development, resulting from actual physical changes in the makeup of their central nervous system. Individuals with these changes do not function well in society. We also know that 30 to 40 percent of kids that are exposed to domestic violence experience direct, direct physical abuse themselves. Programs like the Children Who Witness Violence program, which I want to ask the room, how many people work for the program of Children Who Witness Violence? And who's farthest north? I'd love to hear from someone in the north. Where are you from? Haida Gwaii. Excellent. Um, so here, here are programs that help. It's a specialized program that helps victims of crime. Um, <clears throat> Other areas that we're, sorry, I have to, my apologies, I'm, I'm very, very nervous and I don't speak from notes. So I just want to pause for a second, hit the reset. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, our, our office does advocacy. Our office monitors systems and makes, and advocates to make systems improvement and we do investigations. People are very familiar with the investigations on Schoenburn and Lee, and from that we did huge advocacy that resulted in the Office of the Provincial, sorry, the Provincial Office on Domestic Violence, um, advocating fiercely to look at protective orders being made available and forcible, um, and just having more access to resources for families. We're huge advocates for uh, the, the domestic violence um, units, which right now are only within the urban centers. I'm sure those of you that live beyond Prince George um, are advocating or would love to see services like that in the north, in the more rural communities. Um, we're also uh, big proponents for training. We know that there's um, online training made available for police officers, three and a half hours. It's mandatory for those 4,800 police officers throughout the province. Um, but is that enough? And as you'll know with Mary Ellen, uh, it's never enough. We've always, we've always got to do more, we've always got to be more fierce, and we've got to put um, our money where our mouth is in many ways. Um, we uh, recommend the work of the Domestic Violence Unit, and sorry, the Office of the Domestic um, Violent Unit, but it's understaffed. It doesn't have the manpower to push the vision that's in that office. And so how do we get those uh, resources in the hands of staff that want to make a real difference? We're advocates for safety planning. Um, one thing that we often see in our office, um, because we have an, a mandate for overseeing the Ministry for Children and Family, is that some of the basic needs of housing, bus passes, counseling are not available to children. So I, I hate to say it because I don't mean it in any disrespectful way, um, but when we have a mother who's fled violence, who's trying to get her kids to counseling, one of them special needs, she's trying to get them to school, and take the bus. Um, she's advocating and asking for our office to help with a bus pass. It's just a bit shameful um, that there are so many barriers and hoops to jump through um, to try to get some of the most basic things that many of us in our privileged lives take for granted. Um, I'm not sure how much a bus pass costs these days because it's been a long time since I've taken the bus. Um, but to show that people can't afford those basic needs, um, 
is, is, is something that we fiercely advocate for. Also the accessibility of services up in the north, rural, uh, reserve um, communities. Living up in Hazleton, how many think that there's a transit system in Hazleton? <laughs> is there, is, okay, and we're, yeah. Yeah, so beyond Nanaimo, uh, is there a transit system north of Nanaimo? Port Alberni, very, very fortunate of you. Um, <laughs> but some of these basic things that for our staff, we try to be mindful that what looks like on paper is available to British Columbians is not accessible and equitable um, across the province. So um, really trying to bring that light to frontline sorry, frontline practitioners. We're really, we really commend the work of Pod V for for making more um, accessible training to staff, but it has to be ongoing, not just for new staff, but for the grandfathered staff and, and to constantly refresh and have best practices in our minds. Um, on the issue of protective orders, we have a couple of issues. We're really happy to see that the amendments were made to the FLA uh, last year. The, the $200 fee um, is a concern because it affects, of course, the administration of justice. So for those of you that have an extra $200, um, or the capacity, um, with all due respect, taking a look at the website and the 50 steps that it takes to have your, um, to have the, the fee waived was quite astonishing. Um, because I, I always look at things from the perspective, I have a degree, I feel like I have some capacity, but if I was in, a woman in the, need of, in the middle of crisis and I had to go before the courts against my offender and try to, get, try to save my life and, and the safety of my children, I don't have time to go through, um, to go through websites like that. So um, I think campaigns like be more than a bystander, sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I think many of us share that lens, but I think it's the practitioners working with those at head office and provincial corridors that have the power to make changes, that really understand what are some of the barriers, looking at, looking at things through um, a cultural lens, uh, not just Aboriginal cultural, but all the cultural lenses that we have in our rich, beautiful province of BC. Um, English isn't my second language, but I'm sure if it was, I'd really want, ha want to have access to resources. Uh, so the one is the administration fee, the second is uh, the service orders. So we see that many of the orders are, are given by sheriffs and commissioners, um, which is great. You know, someone, it's, it's great that someone's being served. Have you ever seen that movie? Been served? No? Okay. Anyhow. So um, it's one thing to serve when you're a sheriff, but it's another thing, and I, and I say this as someone who wore um, the Mountie uniform and the power it has by just putting on that outfit, right? And I didn't have a gun, I was a summer student. I had handcuffs and they didn't have give me pepper spray. Um, but anyhow, so, you know, just the uniform alone without um, the tools um, serves as a real influence on people positively and negatively. Um, but for women, if you're trying to issue those orders, um, having that appearance and presence, it could be really impactful. And what we're, we're also saying for the North is for the police to have that constant presence. Just, you know, I, I remember being up in Hazleton roaming around and it's not harassment, it's having a presence. Letting people know that we're here, that we're gonna stand behind these women, that we're gonna protect these women. Um, so those are the two areas that, again, we're happy for the orders um, to be in place and enforceable under the criminal code, um, but we have to reduce those barriers for women. Also exploring things like uh, innovative technology and using tools like electronic monitoring for women uh, that, are, or sorry, offenders that are women, men offenders, perpetrators that are outside of the lower mainland is really critical. Uh, we know that there's, there's some um, success behind having electronic monitoring, so we'd like to see more of that. Uh, the domestic violence courts I mentioned earlier, um, the late uh, Josiah Wood, was a real champion in the Cowichan Valley in Duncan and someone who really uh, shepherded the importance of bringing all of these services together and for women to not only come in and face the, the criminal proceedings of things but also to have access to other resources and advocates like yourself 
um, that go day to day, um, just trying to plant those seeds, plant those seeds, plant those seeds, so that when the time comes that those women know who to turn to when uh, they're ready. Um, so we want to see more of those. I think there's one uh, in BC. Uh, so there's a real, um, there's also really great studies coming out of Alberta that show that uh, victims are better protected, that they're more closely connected to the courts, and they're less likely to renege on their charges um, if they have that involvement with the court, uh, sorry, the domestic violence court. On the issue of resources, I was bugging, um, I was bugging Tracy earlier about what resources are available throughout the province. So how many of you work for a shelter? Transition home? Um, women leaving violence? Counseling? How many of you are beyond Prince George, from beyond Prince George? How many of you are from rural or reserve communities? Does anyone want to be a volunteer like the farthest north reserve community that, that we're from? Fort St. John. So would you say that you have specialized resources available? So that's a big push for our office is just trying to shed light that um, Terrace is a great city and it's a great hub. But if you have a vehicle, if you have money for gas, I think gas is, what, $1.50, if not more. In some cases in the north, like $1.70. If you have all of those resources, it's great. Um, but we have to lessen the load for women to jump through those hoops to access those resources. Um, I'm going to wrap up because I, 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 like I said, I'm a little bit nervous. You know, Mary Ellen, she has big high heels, boots to fill. Um, <laughs> It's not, it's not my area of expertise. What, what is, is I go to work every day and I do advocacy. Women call our office and they're asking for basic things. And what we try to do is hold the system to task by saying, what does the legislation say? What does the policy say? Um, reviewing the, the waiver policy, the Women Against Violence uh, policy, great. It's great to see this all, Jen, and the Attorney General and MCFD working together. Uh, but we have to get those hands into the hands of practitioners who are working front line so that they know how to advocate on behalf of their clients. Um, and that's all I'll, I'll really say. Um, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, I'm going to open the floor to questions. Um, and if I don't have the answer, I'll find out. Um, or we can have a side conversation outside. Yeah? Thank you. Okay, I'm back. I'm a sucker for punishment. <clears throat> Questions, comments? We were also hoping when I was talking to Tracy about um, just having a bit of a dialogue. The presentation earlier, I often find when I come to these um, sessions, I'm not an expert. I know what I know. I've had many years as a mother, as a daughter, as a family member, and as a professional. Um, but we're all kind of collective um, experts, so we're hoping to kind of open the floor. If I don't have the answer, and if you do, then by all means, jump the mic. Hi, I um, am a Stopping the Violence counselor in McKenzie, and we are having issues with housing. And the same things you listed, the transportation. We don't have a transition house, but we do have a um, safe home. But the funding is really, really minimal for what? we have in our community, would your agency be who I refer someone to if there was issues with any of those areas? For the direct service, we would be able to help. Um, the housing, like housing's <laughs> not necessarily within our mandate, but we would be asking the ministry how the ministry is trying to support the family if the ministry has an open like FS file. Okay. Um, but we, a lot of people call us to let us know what's going on throughout the province around funding and where the shortages are and how it's putting people at risk. So. Uh, I welcome those calls as well um, from stakeholders. 
It informs our systemic advocacy. Mary Ellen has her ear to the ground on all sorts of things and we need to hear from frontline staff around what, what's hitting your communities the hardest. Okay, yeah, because we've had issues with uh, women leaving domestic violence and they've got their children with them couch surfing and the only way they can get to the top of the list for housing is to leave the community and go to Prince George who transition house and that would mean they have to take the kids out of school, they have to leave their jobs. So I've been kind of, whoever will listen, I'm shouting out for these women. So, you know, maybe I'll talk to you later and see what you can suggest. The other, th thank you. And what I'd suggest to you, I've left some materials out in the back. Um, don't ever hesitate to call our office. We've got a toll-free line. Our mandate is to provide information, support, and advice. If we, if, if there's an MCFD file or MCFD is directly involved, we can take over the file and advocate on behalf of the child. Um, so lots of powers under Section 10. And those powers are to work with the ministry to say, okay, is this enough? Or what do we need to be doing? Who do we need to call to the table? So those resources are out on the table if you, if you want to chat. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm with um, Lissom's Nass Valley Police-Based Victim Services. Um, when you were talking about um, the police presence and uh, to, to ensure that people know that um, the safety of women and children are really important to us, um, I just wanted, it made me think about, um, it, it, I guess it confirmed what, what we're doing in our department um, is, we're pretty much on the right track. And I wanted to share that we can use some support um, from wherever we can get it. And uh, what we're doing is we're, we're trying to develop our programs, especially with the sexual exploitation program, to um, bring it to the communities, to the leadership and the membership in the communities to, um, so that they can develop safety programs so that it comes from the community so that when, because right now in the communities when there's an incident of domestic violence, um, people kind of sit back and wait for someone to call the police. Even families sit back and wait for somebody to call the police. And uh, when somebody does, that's when everybody jumps on board and what we want to see is for ourselves to take that initiative to uh, not wait to stand up now and say that um, the safety of women and children is important to our communities um, by doing things like putting up billboards and, and talking about uh, that, that proclaim how important the safety is. And also to do things like maybe putting out um, place mats in, I, I heard about, uh, uh, I think it's in BC somewhere where they're, they've printed up place mats to be distributed to restaurants to talk about how um, uh, sexual exploitation is not acceptable in their communities. And we're giving ideas like that to our um, focus groups to say we could come up with something similar to, to talk about how important the safety of our children is uh, because we can't just, because of the people that aren't reporting, we can't just rely on the police because those, those things aren't being reported all the time. Um, just made me think of that when you were talking about the police presence. And I, what I would say to that is I think it's really critical for, especially the, um, where you have an RCMP detachment is to build that rapport with the officer in charge and really um, lay the foundation of, about the types of expectations that you have. Um, protocols between First Nations and the police are really critical to say we want to know if something's happening so that we can support the victim or family. Um, and on the issue of sexual exploitation, I, I went across the country and met with sexually exploited youth, um, males, transgendered, uh, females, and um, I guess the most powerful lesson for me from that, th that I learned from that was just how silence, um, how death deafening and how deadly silence is in our communities. And it's particularly uh, damaging in First Nations communities where everyone knows who the person is, not just particularly First Nations, but 
where everyone knows who the abuser is and there's nothing that you can say or, or do. Um, and, I, and so from a policing perspective, I don't think that police don't want to do anything. They don't know what to do um, because how do they come forward uh, to the community? So I think building those relationships with the officer in charge is really critical. And I have some good resources on sexual exploitation if you'd like. Tracy, are you going or am I going? Hi, Bonnie from Don Cannon again. This is such a great opportunity. <laughs> oh. So one of the things that Don is always challenged by, of course, is that because we're one of the few organizations for women with disabilities that we struggle and try very hard to support girls with disabilities as well. But I think the larger issue of children with disabilities and their particular vulnerability and the fact that there is really literally no agency, including my own, that have been able to drill down into how we better protect children with disabilities, particularly children with some types of disabilities from sexual exploitation and violence. But the one that, that I, I thought would be important to bring to your attention and to raise, because you, you talked about monitoring, is that children in institutional settings, particularly children with disabilities in institutions, and how we can in Canada begin to look at properly monitoring for uh, abuse and the kind of abuse that happens in institutional settings and in, in group home and group housing settings and congregated housing is really critical. So I'd, I'd just really like to hear if there's anything you're doing that's focused on children with disabilities at this stage, what your thoughts are and uh, what kind of things you can see us beginning to do both here in British Columbia and nationally. Well, one thing I'd like to share is that we're doing, and, and it's more broadly, um, we look at all the critical incidences of children and youth in care um, that are receiving services from the ministry. We get a reportable each and every week. Um, and from that, we pull together aggregate information. And so we're doing an aggregate uh, review on sexual assaults of children throughout the province. Many of them have special needs. Many of them are Aboriginal. Many of them are in care. Um, so that, I, I I don't think it's going to be released in 2014. It'll be a, re a report that will come out in, in 2015. But it's under our critical injuries and death reviews um, investigation team. It's not a monitoring. Um, it's not a monitoring report. Um, will the data be aggregated by gender and by by whether it'll be or not? Aggregated, they, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's not specific, but I think for our office, what our, our part of our task is to look at this high level, where are these kids coming from? What are the themes? Um, one thing that we're often seeing is these kids are in AWOL. AWOL from where? AWOL from specialized resources or group homes or institutions, and what is our action plan to ensure that they're safe? And so when you speak of the special needs, CLBC eligible or not, um, is it's, it's a broader spectrum than that when we look at their special needs. The other thing I didn't mention was we have a mandate now to advocate for young adults receiving services through CLBC. Um, so last year there was an amendment to our act and we can advocate for 19 to 24 year olds uh, receiving services through CLBC, which for us has been critical because kids turn 19 and they're, they're so much more vulnerable when they have access to getting their they're taking advantage of very much so for financial and then so they get their checks taken away and then they're sexually exploited and they're in isolated communities. So that's a big area that's come to our attention in the last year. Thanks. So hopefully that helps a bit. I wanted to take the opportunity to express our collective appreciation to your office for um, taking on the issue of uh, domestic violence. Um, the report that you did on Lee and the next report that you did on Schoenborn and the fact that Mary Ellen and others in your office have been um, helping us and helping amplify our voices um, has been hugely important. And I think sometimes, unfortunately, the casualties are the people in the ministries and police and so forth that are trying to make a difference. And it's, we're, we're dealing with systemic problems in terms of lack of investment um, but I just want to publicly say first, thank you, because what you and Mary Ellen have been doing have been really important. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, thank you for that. I mean, she's, there's no doubt she's a champion, and, and we sp as we spoke earlier, um, I think one of my greatest concerns, our act doesn't allow Mary Ellen to serve two terms, uh, or sorry, beyond two terms, so her Two terms is up in two years. You can imagine what kind of trouble she might get into in the next two <laughs> years. Um, 
But you know, these are big issues, right? Mental health, addictions, and domestic violence are huge, and she wants a coordinated, systematic approach uh, to this, and, and training in the hands of frontline practitioners that they can actually have the time to do, ongoing training, on lots of resources. I always think of Pod V and, and the tremendous work that they try to do, um, but not having the resources, it's difficult. So thank you for that, Tracy. Yes, and then the other thing I just wanted to say is in anticipating the report on sexual assault of uh, youth in care, um, I think it's another area that's really important. Um, you know, uh, we've been really focusing a lot of our energies on domestic violence in the province for the last number of years. and. Um, that we have our partners here from Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. We're going to be trying to make a difference in how sexual assault of girls and women is dealt with. And I think, you know, we, for a long time we've been hearing about just terrible things that are happening to girls across the entire province, and especially girls on reserve. Um, and so whether their kids are in care or not, um, I think that having a focus on sexualized violence um, is the way, is the way, is really important. And so thank you for doing that work. And I'm wondering if you could just comment briefly, um, when, if so, if somebody has a situation where, let's say they are aware of girls in a community that are being sexually assaulted and nothing's happening and nobody's intervening, it's obviously a child protection issue. It might not be a pro child protection issue at home. If somebody was to call your office, like how do, how do they make a report to you and what happens once they phone your office? So the best way to call our office is our 1-800 number, but we have three offices in Prince George, Victoria, and Burnaby, so you can come in person as well. Um, Section 10 allows us to call the ministry if, if we need to say we need more information on the situation that's been brought to our attention. We don't need consent of children, so there's nothing in our act that says we need the consent of the child, the youth, or young adult to take part in, in an advocacy case. Um, but in that particular instance, I would be talking strategy. I'd be really wanting to break down like who's involved, who's been told, who, who are the champions in your community, because that's not easy to shed light on. Um, in some cases, you're, I'm not saying making it worse, but you know, it's taking that, picking up that rock and all those crabs, right? Um, you've got to build in supports, but the individual cases, we would be looking at how is the ministry responding to your safety needs right now? So the food, clothing, shelter, do you need a youth agreement? Do you need to be in another community? And it depends, of course, on where the call is coming from. There, all those services aren't always available. Um, so we do the best we can to get the ministry to get a plan in place for those, for those victims. Um, but with, with police, we have under Section 10 the authority to contact the police to say not only our duty to report, but to say are you actively involved in this investigation. The, the protection for them is under Section 23 of our Act that we can't disclose that where the information came from. So um, I, I hope that helps. It's delicate. We don't, we've never really gotten calls around big investigations that way. People will phone us, though, to say kids are being abused in these certain care homes. And that is more of an alert for an investigation under critical injuries and death reviews team. Hi there. Um, I'm a new face in this room. My name is Sonia Ramsey, and I'm the new executive director of the 100 Mile House and District Women's Centre. And in our Women's Centre, we actually uh, operate the Stop the Violence counselling program as well as the Safe House program and I recently located there from Terrace and being someone who actually identifies as a woman of the north having lived on the 67th parallel outside of Whitehorse in Old Crow Yukon, uh, Prince George, Terrace and now in 100 Mile House I can't thank you enough for highlighting the the real realities of issues in rural and northern communities. Um, Response time by police is drastically different when you're inside a municipality versus one of the outlying reserve communities. Uh, the transportation issues that we face are night and day in comparison to municipal areas. Um, as an example, just last week, we had a grandma, an auntie, and three kids leaving the reserve because their parents were on a tear wanting to end the lives of the grandma and auntie. And so they were in massive danger. And they called us 
and our safe house coordinator went to task and all of our safe homes were full. And the transition homes were full in Quinnell, Williams Lake, uh, Kamloops. And so while children who witness abuse programs stop the violence, the BC housing, it's all of these different contracts, but they all walk hand in hand and they are all so important in rural areas to, you know, I'm always hearing funding formulas are being changed and that they are directly allotted per capita basis. But I would love to change the conversation from the number of people that live in an area deserving funds to the needs that are actually present in that area. So my comments, sharing my information, is really just a heartfelt gratitude to know that you are talking about these aspects and the challenges that we truly do face. And if I may, I would love to share another example. So women fleeing abuse don't necessarily have an income statement considering the power dynamics in their relationship. They don't necessarily have a fixed address. And in our community, um, the eligibility criteria to receive food at our food bank. Um, and of course, this is like a local conversation or whatever, but it's just one of the aspects that, well, it's one of the realities that we face in helping the women in, who come to us for services and programs. Um, so because they don't have an income statement and because they don't have a fixed address, they're not able to access food. So our emergency food hampers that we access funds for through our gaming grant actually wind up being a dependence for the women who come to our office. And so it's really, it truly is a coordinated, systematic approach that we need to have these conversations a part of. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, and, and I really wanted to put emphasis on, on the rural communities um, and outside of the city. Not I grew up in the city, um, but I often hear people, because our offices are in urban, center, urban centers, people talk about what they don't have. And I think, wow, you know, if you could really have a different perspective to understand um, what it takes to drive into terrorists or what it takes. I, I think of Haida Gwaii. I don't think Haida Gwaii has any CLBC services. Um, so we, we challenge that conversation to say, how are people supposed to access these services? Um, and web, web is one thing if you have, I, how much do, are you guys paying for the internet? I think it costs me like $150 a month to have TV, a phone, and cable, right? And then we're talking about bus passes and you roll in the mix and it's not, uh, it's not accessible. So thank you for that. <coughs> Here's Another question or comment? Hi, Melanie. Uh, my, name's, uh, my name's Ian, and I'm a team leader with MCFD. And uh, I wanted to um, uh, say a couple of things. One, one is uh, good job filling in on short notice. Uh, we're feeling for you. Thank you, thank you. Um, one but of the things, oh, sorry, go ahead. It's okay, my little one's been sick too, so it's just that frazzle and Tracy, you know, it's, this is a tough crowd, you guys, come on. <laughs> you guys are tough. I'm like, they're gonna ask me about the legislation, or I'm talking about funding. I'm kidding, anyhow. It's all one of the, the other good. things I wanted to say is that I read every word of the Lee Report and the Schoenborn Report, um, and I consider uh, myself, and I hope the room might uh, eventually too, a uh, friend of the ending violence movement. Um, one of the things I appreciate about both of those reports is they, uh, they didn't, I, I felt that they had the proper focus and they didn't throw individual workers under the bus. Um, I experienced those reports simply as Mary Ellen holding a mirror in front of me and asking me to look at how I do things. Um, so I did that. Uh, and as an encouragement to you, I, I, I changed the way we do things in Abbotsford um, through the help of some collaborations with some partners who have come to mean a lot of things to me and uh, with uh, very little, well, with no added money. Um, I, one of the things I am now the proudest uh, 
of is that I supervise uh, clinically a social worker who works in a fully integrated domestic violence unit uh, in Abbotsford that involves two police detectives, two victim support workers, a social worker, and a probation officer, uh, and supported by two uh, K-file specialists at Crown Council. So, I guess my comment is, uh, it's more a comment than a question. Um, collaboration does work. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. And some of us do read those reports and listen to them. And uh, so I hope the tone of them continues in our work together. Thank you. We were just at a forum out in Chilliwack looking at um, women that are incarcerated and the rights of their children and really coming together in a, with a collaborative lens to look at what's in our backyard and how we can kind of pool our resources together so that parents have the tools um, to protect their children and, um, and it's not always the fear that their kids are gonna go into care. Um, as, so changing the conversation. So thank you for that, Ian. Hi, thank you, Melanie, for being here and, and pitch hitting, and it was really great, and you did not appear nervous at all, so you did a great job, in my opinion. I have kind of a two-pointed um, question, comment. Um, we often see, um, I'm a community-based victim service worker in a, a fairly rural community. We certainly don't have amenities, and when you said transit system, I went, yeah, once a week. So um, so we have some struggles as well, and we're a fairly populated area, so there are some difficulties. My um, question is if it would be your office that would help um, advocate. You brought up the changes to the FLA. I know myself I was very um, hopeful when I saw Section 127 become a part of those and how they're interpreted and, and just an extra measure for safety when... Um, the opposing party would be in contravention of that order. As we, we used to struggle with police assist clause often and, and how it's worded or not worded and it had to be there in order to get some additional assistance when one partner decided to use excessive force outside of that family agreement. So if that would be something that your office, it, it, it seems that we are still struggling with that and the section 127 has not necessarily cleared it up an awful lot and the other Part of that is I do believe the ministry has a section 28 that where they could, um, at what point would they help implement a safety uh, mechanism for women and children that are fleeing um, significantly high-risk files? I can't speak um, <clears throat> so much. We don't see a lot of section 28s in our practice on the advocacy front. I can't speak so much to the protective orders, only to say that Mary Ellen is on justice as much as she possibly can. Uh, there was a fact sheet that was recently produced, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but it speaks to the number of orders that have been enforced, uh, implemented or enforced in the last year. I think it's too soon to tell what the systemic issues are. For us, the issues right now are the fee, um, and the and the infor like the delivery um, are the two areas that we're trying to focus on. So, so the question was, once when, when, when we're granted that in family court, um, how do we advocate for the enforcement of that? When specifically when there's a section 127, a component of our family protection order. I'm I'm going to put that to an expert in the room. Sorry, because I I really I don't deal with justice so much in my day to day work, and FLA is not a part of our mandate. So I'm gonna put it to an expert in the house to answer. I'm using my call a <laughs> lifeline, anything here. <laughs> you know, who wants to be a millionaire? There you go. I, I can probably speak to that. Okay, Clark, I noticed, you. was hiding in the corner over there. So I will, uh, uh, Clark, Clark and I Clark, and a number of Clark, others Clark. Um, are sitting on a, a provincial uh, working group to deal with uh, Issues around around protection orders, and um, there are there are a number, uh, and we're aware of that, um, and uh, we're we're hoping we're working really hard, and we're hoping to get things resolved um, where the when when the order is uh, is issued in family court, the local police of jurisdiction would be notified right away that there is an order in existence. Um, we're also working on issues around service. I know that's a big issue. Um, and um, 
the confirmation of that service, so an affidavit of service that would be completed by, by a sheriff or by the police. Uh, I don't know if those are the main things you had in mind. Yeah, so we're certainly very aware that there are issues there. We're working very hard to resolve them, um, and it, it is a priority for sure. Thank you. Thanks, Loretta. Um, it's Gisela here. I just wanted to add to that, yes, all to what Loretta said, that service is an issue because, as we know, because it's not a criminal order, even though there is the possibility of it being enforced now under the criminal code, it's not in criminal court, so it's not automatic that it would be served by a sheriff. So there's movement towards making that practice of service more consistent. Um, the other piece I wanted to say is that there's going to be a panel tomorrow on the Family Law Act tomorrow morning, so there'll be a bit more discussion on protection orders under the Family Law Act. So we won't have all the answers, but there'll be an opportunity for uh, more discussion on those orders. The other piece that I just wanted to add is that I know that there's movement afoot to try and make the wording of the orders more consistent, so there'll be more discussion about that, because as we know historically how the order is worded, um, gets a lot of um, people like lawyers and police excited about whether it can be enforced, so. Thank you. I, so I think it's a wrap. Um, I got my time to go one minute. Thank you everyone. Enjoy the rest of your conference.